the day that the Pope was to make his address, November 27, 1095, the late morning air was crisp and the sky cloudless. Thierry de Coudray didn't need his cloak. A warmer wind had blown in during the night and driven away the bone-chilling damp. As the sun rose towards its highest point, the Bishop of Clermont's guardsmen rode along the grassy aisle and called, All gather, for His Holiness the Pope is soon to speak. Thierry joined the barony men in the crowd of noblemen moving down the grassy aisle toward the dais. He and Martin helped Alphonse walk to the high-backed benches set up for frail nobles and clergy, then returned to stand with their fellows in the ranks of noblemen. Peasants and artisans took places where they pleased, and their betters made no objection. The Pope's procession approached on the path leading from the gates of Clermont and turned onto the far end of the grassy aisle. Before the dais, distinctly uniformed guards took places beside the door to an ornate barreled-roofed carriage, and Pope Urban II stepped out. A fit man of fifty-four years, he waved off assistance, took his seat on the canopied throne, and pulled back his firm-trimmed hood to reveal strong features and close-cropped gray hair. A bishop placed the domed crown of the papacy on his head. Urban rose and made the sign of the cross with his right hand. All present kneeled as he reverently said the pater noster, and stood as he raised both hands to shoulder height, palms upward. He turned to the bishop and grimaced. The richly robed cleric stepped forward and took the heavy crown and replaced it with a mitre covered with embroidered cloth of gold. The pope took his place at the lectern at the front of the dais, warming to the audience with self-deprecating anecdote. His style of speech was pleasing and disarming, yet powerful, could be heard by all. He surveyed the crowd, giving extra scrutiny to the high-ranking noblemen who stood in the first ranks, and began his address. Most beloved brethren, I, Urban, by the permission of God, chief bishop and prelate of the whole world, would extend our own welcome and blessing to all of you. Applause and cheers followed, and the Pope raised a hand for quiet. I have been urged by necessity to come here as God's ambassador with a message most urgent for all Christians, but would first speak a divine admonition to you, his servants. The crowd fell to silence as the Pope continued. Noblemen, God has put you as stewards over his family to minister to it. But if you fall careless or negligent in your duty, and wolves carry away your sheep, you will surely lose the reward laid up for you by God. First, correct yourselves and become free from blame, that you may be able to correct those who are subject to you. If you wish to be the friends of God, gladly do these things that you know will please Him. Let matters that pertain to the church be governed by the laws thereof, and its clergy be free from secular power. But see that church offices not be bought or sold, and that the tithes that belong to God be faithfully paid. Any man who seizes a bishop or clergyman, monks or nuns or pilgrims or their servants, punish him as an outlaw. For if a man who does not give part of his goods as alms is punished with the damnation of hell, how should he be punished who robs another of his goods? The noblemen glanced at each other, nodding agreement, and looked satisfied. Urban swept a rigid forefinger over them and spoke again sharply. Think that I do not speak of you that stand here before me? I am told that you are so weak in your exercise of justice that those who would have safety on the roads of your provinces fall victim to robbers by day and night. And those robbers be not only common criminals, indeed your knights and armsmen number among them. Therefore I reenact the truce of God 
proclaimed long ago by our holy fathers, but for a long time shamefully cast into disregard. I exhort and demand of each of you that you keep the truce in your own diocese. If any man would be led by his avarice and arrogance to break that truce, by the authority of God he shall face the penalty of excommunication. The high nobleman, who had but a few minutes earlier looked at their fellows in complacence, now cast round with fearful faces, knowing that the Pope had seen into their hearts. A discussion amongst them ensued, and before too long a time had passed, the greatest among them, a mighty count, knelt before the dais. Your Holiness, we give thanks to God that you have seen fit to reveal our grievous shortcomings. We would make repentance and a faithful promise that all not of justice will be brought to such in our domains, and that truce be kept on penalty of our souls. Urban looked at him sternly. Do you now promise, and by God's grace, your mistakes will be forgiven? After Urban had heard and made judgment on other matters of faith and law, he again took the lectern. Now that you have heard our words of correction, and made firm promises to keep peace among yourselves and preserve the rights of the Church, I will speak of this message, one that warns of the greatest danger to all Christendom. The crowd grew hushed, full attention on the Pope. He took a sip of water and again spoke. The same Seljuk Turks who wrested vast territories from the empire of the Byzantines twenty-four years past again show signs of warlike intent toward our Christian brothers in the East, and at this very present pose direct threat to the ancient and holy city of Constantinople. The Emperor Alexius has requested that I call upon the arms-bearing men of France to join in a mission of utmost consequence, one that will at least thwart these pagan Turks in any scheme to make a western invasion, and at the greatest drive them out of the Christian lands they now occupy. Thierry, drowsy after a heavy breakfast, came to full attention. The Pope's words had struck a loud note in his warrior's mind. Urban's voice rose. These Turks have killed and captured many Christians, and have destroyed churches, and devastated the empire of the Byzantines. If this be permitted to continue, the faithful of God will be much more widely attacked by them, first to take Constantinople. Such a conquest would provide them with a firm base from which to invade and conquer lands that lie westward, Christian nations might well be reduced and the 1100 years of progress made by Christ's faith destroyed. The wind gusted cold and hard and Urban turned to the churchmen in his retinue. The crowd again grew restive, murmuring in nervous excitement. Thierry looked around him. Count Bayard stood immersed in Urban's words. His younger son, Everard, beside him at respectful attention. Gautier's expression evidenced only boredom and cynical disdain. Urban, warmed by a cup of wine, plunged into greater detail. The caliphs of the Seljuks can hardly be called men. Indeed, they are demons of the blackest heart. The lives of Christians who dwell within the cities and lands ruled by their armies of mindless friends, of mindless fiends, have become a living hell on earth. Though I can hardly voice description of the atrocities and injustices inflicted on innocent Christian pilgrims who seek only to visit the birthplace and lands of our Lord, I must do so for the Seljuks are masters of the cruelest tortures. Of certainty, the servants of hell have no greater skill. 
with swords. They split the bellies of peaceful Christian men, children, and women with child in search of gold and jewels. They violate Christian men with circumcision and pour the blood thereof on altars and into baptismal fonts. As the Pope spoke of Seljuk atrocities, Thierry's stomach clenched in anger and tears clouded his eyes. He glanced at those near to him. Tears streamed down battle-scarred faces, and hardened men of all ranks wept openly or cursed under their breath. Though Urban spoke aloud to all present, he also spoke inwardly and privately to Thierry de Coudry. Urban slammed a fist to the lectern and paused for a long minute. He appraised his hearers with a hard and piercing gaze and spoke with great force. Noblemen and knights of France, though you call yourselves Christians, by your warring without cease and murder of other and innocent beyond count in your greed for lands and gold, you have placed your souls in utmost peril. But you may yet find redemption by the way of the very prowess that you so gravely now misuse. Nobleman shifted uncomfortably, and Urban again slammed the lectern. Let those who have been robbers in the guise of knights now truly become knights. Let those who have been fighting against their brothers and relatives now fight in a proper way against the infidels. The time has come for you, who have been wearing your very selves out in body and soul, to draw together as brothers in arms and in Christ. Be you thus united, you will reclaim Christian lands long lost, and by God's command you will drive the enemies of Christ from the place most sacred to Christendom, the blessed city of Jerusalem. Urban drew breath, stretched out his arms. I challenge every capable man of the sword, be he rich or poor, knight or foot soldier, to give his life to this holy mission. Die you on the way, whether by land or sea, or in battle with the pagans, by the power of God with which I am invested, you shall have remission of all sins and the key to the eternal kingdom of God. Any person who wishes to take vows and enter directly into Christ's army, step forward and do so. The audience stood astounded and silent. Urban urged them, Willing Christians, do not hesitate. The time grows short, and those who would go ought not put off this journey, but need rent their lands and collect the funds for their expenses. As soon as winter is over and spring comes, let them be ready to eagerly set out on the way with God as their guide. For such is his will. Urban once more blessed him and returned to his chair. A bishop offered him a goblet, took the letter and spoke. I am Adamar, Bishop of Le Puy. His Holiness Pope Urban has asked me to re represent him for the remainder of the meeting. All who would join Christ's army now step forward and receive the keys to the kingdom of heaven, for God wills it. A full half of the noblemen and present, and a greater number of the peasants and men-at-arms caught up the cry, God wills it, and crowded to the dais. Women asked for the cross alongside their men, and at more than five hundred the number of volunteers far exceeded that expected. The scores of church officials who had shared the dais with the Pope waded into the crowd and began to hear the vow of each person individually. Thierry's own will, and a greater one, pulled him forward. He fell to his knees before the dais. As Bishop Aramar spoke the vow to him, he repeated the words, I vow to henceforth fight as a soldier of Christ unto death or safe return, to obey my superiors, and to wear the cross in full view, 
until my vow be fulfilled. Adamar pinned a black felt cross to the right shoulder of his gambeson, and put his hands on his head and said, Your sins are forgiven. Go, join your brother knights in Christ's army, and sin no more. Adamar moved to the next man as Thierry rose to his feet. Count Bayard knelt in the grass enraptured, and his younger son, Evrard, knelt beside him. Gautier stood in place, arms crossed, dark and surly expression unchanged. He caught Thierry's eye and sneered. The volunteers patiently waited to take their vows, and after all who had asked were sworn, a cleric stepped to the lectern and announced, all kneel for his holiness. The Pope once more took the lectern. You are now soldiers of Christ and sworn to his service only. Go and prepare for the duty with which God has charged you. Again Urban said the pater noster with the greatest of devoutness, then raised his palms upward in a magnanimous gesture of blessing. The volunteers rose in unison and to a man turned to watch him step off the dais into his waiting carriage. Mm -hmm.